I'm Jason Sylvia, and this is The Creative Capital Show. A show about creative people and how those creative people turn into entrepreneurs by taking their creativity and turning it into a business and facing all the trials and tribulations along the way. Be a fan, become a polymath. Polymath, it's an interesting word, one with varying definitions. One of those definitions states that a polymath is a person with extraordinarily broad and comprehensive knowledge. Now, when it comes to a person that fits that description, I can't think of anyone better than this episode's guest, Jabron PVD. Jabron has broad and extensive knowledge from working in the worlds of modeling, music, fashion, design, content creation, social media, marketing, hosting, interviewing, and last but certainly not least, the cultural and creative past and present of his home city of Providence, Rhode Island. Speaking of Providence, it makes perfect sense that Jabron added the three-letter moniker of the city, PVD, to his name as he has become equal parts creative leader and cultural ambassador for the creative capital. In this episode, I sit down with Gibran to talk about topics such as having a strong sense of self, the importance of being a fan, his time working for Joe Perez, how content changed during the blog era, the ins and outs of working at Carmeloop, touring and hosting during the Verge campus tour, creative marketing in the modern era, knowing when to be quiet to learn from those around you, and much, much more. And it all started from a conversation with a photographer. Enjoy. So, Jabron. What's up? Welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. Hey, man. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Much appreciate you for coming on. And... You know, it was funny. I was doing my research and I was getting ready for the day. And um, thanks to my Disney Plus subscription, (laughs) I can uh, watch old Simpsons episodes on a loop. And there was an older episode where uh, Homer's just like in bed and Marge's walking around. and He's like, you know, I've done a lot of things in my life, like race car driver, astronaut, like all these like different odd jobs that he's had over the years. Yeah. And it was very poignant because i was just like oh that reminds me of of who i'm going to be interviewing uh mr jabron model jabron etc very fitting but uh for those and we're gonna we're gonna go through the origin story a little bit but for this one for this episode for anybody who's been listening to the show anybody new to the show we're going to use your story kind of as a jumping off point for for questions because on this show i always try to go into the like the story but also like the tactical gotcha. um thank you which i think is helpful for people so the super f- short version for those of you who have never heard of you or have never seen you on a billboard or after the fact are going to start checking for you now and <laughs> probably like oh i've seen that guy in a billboard before and do yeah. other things yeah. uh who are you and what is, what is the short elevator pitch origin story yeah i'm brown pvd um, formerly known as Model Gibran. Um, that, was a, that was a bygone era, but a really good era in my life and in my career. Um, without knowing that I was making, that I had like an AKA. So the cool thing about hearing Model Gibran right now is that it was never meant to be a thing. Um, when I started modeling, which is my first career choice, and for always will forever be my career choice. But when I first started modeling and, in, and Instagram and social media was like becoming a thing outside of Facebook and, and MySpace, um, as I'm diving deeper and more professionally into, into modeling, a lot of the, um, almost a good chunk of models were already doing that. It, so it wasn't, it wasn't a sense of like, this is a cool name. It was just, like a makeup artist having MUA 
in front of their name is like what, right. what model was to like a model. Like you put gotcha. model that in front of your social media handle. It just was what it was. Yeah. You just, you just did that. Yeah. That was just the thing people did. Yeah. And, um, it, it caught wind. It was really, it was really fucking cool for how, one for how long it lasted and for how long it's lingered in my life for people that, um, know me and for the people that kind of re-get to know me it was like oh wait yeah you're the model jabron kid and i'm like well now i'm jabron pvd but it's it's cool yeah um yeah so i'm jabron pvd all around uh talent provider talent coach talent director um entertainer creative director uh, DJ, TV personality, marketer. Yeah, DJ, studio TV manager, personality. Yeah, a lot of different men's men's stylist. Again, hence hence the Homer Simpson doing all the things reference. One hundred percent. Um, and so, like I was saying before, going to use your story as more of a jumping off point for for questions. So, um, in doing my research, I found in your early years, right. Um, you know, as you were getting into modeling, you were, I remember in another interview, you had stated that you were a kid that you just kind of like, you were, it almost seemed like you were very comfortable in your own skin at an early age. Mm -hmm. And would that, would you say that's accurate that yeah. you had that at an early age? Like you already just had that confidence. It's like, Hey, I know what I'm about. I know what I am. And I like, I know what I'm into. <laughs> yeah, man, that's a really cool question. Absolutely. Um, that's kind of always been something that's been a part of people's conversation about me. Um, and as I started to get older, I, like is when I started to notice it. Um, and I, and I think that that's one of the reasons in like middle school and high school and like just my life outside of, uh, outside of that, um, that's what people typically always gave me a compliment on, which was really awesome. Um, people just always had that, like, man, I wish I was like you. Like, I wish I had your kind of character, like your charisma and your character and all that kind of jazz. But yeah, I've always been pretty much grounded ever since I was, I was a young kid, just kind of felt like that and was never really into peer pressure. I was really into Power Rangers and Hey Arnold. And those are some of the stepping stones that made me feel like I wanted to be me at all times. And I know that sounds kind of cliche, but that's really something that's very synonymous with me and how people know me for sure. Like it's, it's probably one of the most, one of the more like staple pieces of who I am. Do you think, do you think that confidence is, and correct me if I'm wrong, do you think that confidence is at least in your early years, if I'm not mistaken, you wanted to be an actor. Like it seems like you've always wanted to entertain it. Is that kind of, did that confidence play into that? That you're like, Hey, I want to entertain people. I'm an actor. Like I'm a character. I'm like, but you not playing other characters like you in and of yourself are like a personality and like, and like a person that wants to entertain. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a cool way to look at it. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that. I just knew that I enjoyed it and I knew that I know. And I knew that it was just me. Um, I took theater when I was in high school and it's just natural. It's just, I don't know how to explain it. It wasn't something that like, was ever a doubt in my mind, gotcha. but it didn't become a point of like, I want to entertain people until I was like, maybe my early twenties when I was like, Oh wow. I could, I could like, I can compartmentalize this stuff and like package it and then sell it. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause that's something I want to get into later. Again, just using, using your story as, as things to ask, because there is a certain point that I want to ask about where I, I did notice that. And I really want to get some more like exploratory questions on that. Cause I Thanks. think it's something to get into. Um, so, you know, in your, in your high school years is when you started or you were starting to get into modeling mm -hmm. and one person I want to mention, and I want to make sure I'm just getting his name right. So if I mispronounce it, let me know. Um, Jeffrey Parrish that, that am I getting the name right? Dude, what the fuck? And <laughs> what do you work for the feds, bro? <laughs> Shout out to Todd of the Creator on that one. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, he was the one that gave you that that break, that, like gave you the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, kind of what's the catalyst for all of this, if I'm not mistaken. 
So who is that? And, and what kind of impact did Jeffrey Parrish have as far as, you know, giving you that break, giving you that first chance to do anything really? Again, then you must work for the feds because I just do my research, man. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I sincerely really appreciate that because he is one of, yeah, he's definitely the number one person that, um, changed my life for sure. Uh, Jeffrey JP, as I call him and as his friends call him, all his close friends is, uh, very actually as at the time was just starting off as photography. And as of today, he's a world renowned, uh, yeah, a world renowned photographer, um, has worked with tons of really great brands and um, models and so on and so forth. But who he was then was a budding 33 to 34 year old man who was at the prime of his professional career and understanding that he was bored, tired, unenthused and a lot of other things that just with, um, you know, with corporate America and his corporate job that he was phenomenal at and he had just started modeling. And at that same time is when I started to take modeling serious too. So I was 18, fresh out of high school and I was doing everything that I needed to do to, um, I was doing everything that I needed to do to, you know, pursue, pursue modeling in, in, in a professional standard. And I had found this website called model mayhem. And I was like, all right, this is the, this is the industry standard. This is where people get found. I know it's tried and true. I did all my research and he is literally with just the, the regular photos that I posted up within a week's time of me being on there. The first guy that, you know, gave me an opportunity Un unbeknownst to me of, of knowing that he was just starting as well, but had a knack for it. So I meet this guy and the story goes is that I was so nervous and I was so scared and I'm meeting somebody through the internet that I flaked on him our first meeting. Oof. That's yeah. And thank God that, that I thank God for that mistake because was it a bad mistake? So Jeffrey, the very, that very night after flaking on him and not responding to him and just letting him know that I wasn't going to show up, gave me the fucking most Southern <laughs> lyrical butt whooping, uh, uh, any grandmother would fear themselves. I got a, such a fucking email back from, from JP and he was like just about done with me, but I think he did it in a way to teach me something because he gave me a chance the very next day and I, and I took it serious. So I met him, we met in the mall and man, the work that he and I did literally propelled my career to where it was today because of how good the work was that we did. It was very avant-garde. It was very harsh lighting, really edgy stuff. I'm like in a trench coat, like one of my very first steps into modeling and it was like already at a high level. I felt like I was working for Gucci. The only thing that was missing was like an octopus on my chest that just made it that much more avant-garde and you know that jazz without me knowing it back then. But Jeff, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Parrish, JP is like the most integral person to my career um, as a whole, even after even everything that I did after modeling, man, he's like by far the most important timeline in, in my life that, that thank God he's still a part of it to this day. So, and I want to stay on just this, this part, uh, for a moment uh, chronologically, just cause there are some exploratory questions I have. Um, so somebody gave you a, a break, like somebody gave you a shot, right? And do you think that that is still, I don't want to say needed, but do you think that creatives out there should be trying to uh, find somebody to give them the shot or is, has it gotten to the point that because of technology, because of the way the world is today, Hey, if you can't find a shot, make your own shot. Or is it a balance? Does, do, are there like, the, you know, certain things that come into play? Uh, yeah. You hit it on the mark right there at the end. For me, it's a balance. I believe that, I believe that people who are in a position need to create opportunity for people, but also be the opportunity that people need. 
And what I mean by that first standard is that you need like guys like me. I don't think that it's a must to have the responsibility, but it does it like the cliche is that with great responsibility comes wait with great power comes great responsibility. There you go. You, wow. You had it. Fucking sorry, Uncle Ben. Um, but I don't, I also don't feel that like everybody needs to abide by that. You know what I mean? I think that it's up to the person. Like, I don't want anybody trying to be somebody's mentor that doesn't know how to be a mentor. So I just want to be able to gotcha. understand that balance. But you, you do have to be somebody's like, I, fuck, I hate the word to use the word have, but you should, I hope even in, in any way that you can, anybody that gets to a certain level, you should be somebody's inspiration. So I just feel like it's a healthy balance of the two. I think that the artist is trying to be somebody needs to create their atmosphere, their, their, their world. Mm -hmm. And they gotta be guys and girls like me that can, that need to go and be in those, in those sectors as well. And then it's in like, you know, once you get into the industry and you're, you know, jabbing with whomever it is that you're jabbing with, that's at that high industry level, you should still be a part in my opinion, a part of the shit that's still bubbling up because you can, you can fade. And if you're not relevant to the kids, then you're not relevant at all. I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how much money you think makes you or anything like that, or how much houses you have. But if you're not relevant to the kids, no one gives a fuck. So you need to be able to find a happy meeting in between the two where you also like, you don't have to be the person that's out there seeking it, but if it comes to your table, you should be able to say, Hey, I can help. And even if it's like just a small direction, you know what I mean? Like you got to point people that deserve an opportunity in the right direction, even if you can't sustain it for them. So be, be ready for what, if that comes to be able to do that, to yeah. have the ability, like be prepared to have the ability to do that. Or be, just have the site for it. There you go. Have the site for it. Like have the site for the, for the guys and women who just, you know, understand you, see it the same way that you do. It doesn't gotcha. have to be everybody, but like if you resonate with with another artist and you can, you know that you can help them. I would hope that you would. Going to tap into that in a moment. A um, couple quick questions on just the modeling industry in general, because I think this might be useful. Uh, and this is just some shameless cross self promotion here. Um, so there's an earlier episode with uh, Brittany Taylor, and. Cool. Brittany was uh, talking about, you know, her experience with photography and how it's not always the um, high end, like fashion model shoots, at least from a photographer standpoint, that like are the big payoffs, even though from a non-industry person, from somebody on the outside looking in, it looks like, oh, that's where you get the most paid, right? <laughs> and she was going, no. So my question for you is, are there misconceptions in the modeling industry about how just the business side of it works? Like, like you as a model, are you like a, like a general contractor? Like, do you have to kind of manage yourself? Like, yeah, you have an agency and they help you find work, but are you like your own manager and kind of running your own business at that point? Because like you yourself are the business being a model. I've always wondered that. Um, it's all of the above. It's every, it's, it's everything that you could think of it to be. Some people like me, are self-managed and I have a manager, but she's all she's really providing me is the celebrity status and the gigs. And she's managing, she's managing the conversations between the two, between me and leveraging my cost. Gotcha. Um, so that she gets her 10% and I get all of every, all of everything that's due to me because of my background and, and you know my years of work. Some people, some models, whether male or female, male or woman, excuse me, um, maybe have like a more dedicated manager that's actually managing um, day to day, and it's not just more or less like like a situation between me and my agency. That's just more of a contractual. Like, like you said, like contractor situation, right. um, you'll have somebody that is treated like a rapper. Like you have a whole team, you got a whole this, you got a stylist, you have a makeup guy, you got a makeup girl, or you have this whole engine behind you because they're trying to build you to that status because 
you're an influencer, you're this, or you, you know, it's either or. You so could you can either, be your own business, or you cannot be your own business. But it, or, or you could be your own business, and somebody's just somebody's built the infrastructure for you around gotcha. your name, as opposed to just day to day work for modeling. Because I remember in another interview, you were saying like you're the you're the type that you do do you you do you do your homework, and you're always doing the homework and doing the research. So that that's like something that that, I, that caught my ear, and I was like, oh, so even even from like, seems like the earlier years, like you were about like, I'm going to take control and on what I do and how this is going to go, which yeah. I think is a powerful thing. I don't think a lot of people make that realize or they make that realization until it's too late or they already signed the dotted line. It seemed like even before you started doing any, like all the other things you do, you were like, no, I, I gotta, I have to manage myself and kind of take control of what I'm doing because for whatever the positive reasons are, but it seems like you had that realization early on. Yeah, I think that it was because that's how it started for me. Like in the city, I was, you know, it's just really easy with social media and emailing and stuff like that. It's just, you know, I like to control what I got going on. I'm really good at scheduling. So I just rather do it myself, you know, but some people don't have that day to day. Sometimes they just want to be the artist and I have the, I have the ability to be both, I have the ability to manage and to be the talent and not feel overwhelmed all the time because I enjoy both sides of it. I like the business, but I also like the end results too. I like just being able to show up, but I like to stand on my own grounds, you know, like I like building my own blocks. I can tell you that sometimes I really do wish that I had an, an assistant and a PR person and a manager that's and a booking agent that's doing it all just for Jabron PVD. But I just, I mean, I just don't care. I don't care for all that. Like I like me, like I, yeah, my career is my part-time full-time job. Like it's what I do. So I got all the time in the world for it. So speaking of people giving breaks and opportunities, moving on to the next chronological part, um, two very important names. Uh, one by the name of Mr. Kanye West, yeah, or as he calls himself, I think it's just Ye now. Yeah. If, if that was that, if the name change, I don't know how valid name changes are anymore. I think, I think rapper rapper standpoint is Ye, and yeah, like he still goes by Kanye West because that's all of his branding. And then also uh, a Mr. Joe Perez. Absolutely. Um, if I have the story right, you met Joe Perez at a party, and you. <laughs> And feel free to correct me, but I want to ask a question about this. You impressed him with your knowledge of music, mm -hmm. uh, so much so that he had enough self awareness, like, "Hey, the music that you know about, I am not super versed in this arena." Mm -hmm. And then from that party, it led to an eventual job working work. It was working for Kanye West, but you, but. Joe Perez was more like the direct person you were working with. If I have, if I have this, this correct. Uh, like, yes and no, no. Okay. Like we were employees of Donda. Okay. So, so, um, and that was before Donda even came into, into the situation. I, so to answer your question, I worked for Kanye West directly. Okay. For sure. Like I, it was me, Virgil, Joe, Don C and Kanye. That was what my team consisted of. What the team was working on when I initially got on was the blog. So Kanye had a... Kanye, Kanye University? Yeah, very famous blog in the early 2010s. It was called Kanye University. It was up for like about five years. I mean, it was like him documenting his life by his own words. And a lot of phenomenal things came out of it. I feel like I was, I was one of the thought... I was one of the brains behind, you know, alongside Joe Perez of shifting culture in the blog world. We really did something that was different and it set the standard for everybody else. And I want to ask about that, but I just want to pause for real quick, just because the, the one you met Joe Perez and you were impressed him, you impressed him with your, with your mm -hmm. knowledge of music and things like that. I want to ask just cause for for the benefit of anybody listening, especially young creatives, did you realize that your knowledge of music, it, it, like 
could be utilized to get you through through doors and get you possible jobs or is more something that you're just being natural because you were enthused about something and then all of a sudden this person was like oh hey here's here's where i have a gap yeah. this person has a knowledge in it we could use this person on our team yeah i think that, that yeah i think that last one is is like what i was thinking at the time i'm an inner city kid you know i'm born and raised in providence um, by way, uh, like, you know, in the area of Chad Brown and like more towards like the North Providence area. So, you know, I don't come from the hood. I don't come from the project. Oh, I, I come from like the projects in a sense, but I'm not from Chad Brown projects. I just want to make sure that I make that clear, but I'm, I'm from the hood. So like music is, is what I, is what I was, especially at that time. I'm like, you know, it's everything that it is about me. It's, it's just because I loved it. It wasn't because I was trying to become a journalist or because I thought that it could make me money. It was just a based of like, this is what I fucking love. I love this. this is like, just like anybody else loves business or grows up to love anything else. Like, it's just what I was, you know, if people love boats, then that's what they, that's what they want to talk about every single day. And it naturally came out and then yeah. it led to something. Yeah. But without me having to, I had no clue, you know, Joe was dating a woman at the time when I had just started working at the Apple store and his girlfriend took a liking to me because she loved all the shit that I love. And she was like, Oh my God, like this place is so, was so boring before you got here because all I want to do is talk about like hip hop music and I can talk to you. That led to her telling her boyfriend about me. And we all knew that she dated Kanye, but uh, that she, that she dated Joe, who worked for Kanye. But it was it was just one of those things that like you just kept to yourself, you know. You didn't, you never brought it up to her. But she and I got a friendship. About like three to six months later of me working working at Apple for that first that, those first six months, I met him, and we had a convo. He's like, "Yeah, she's telling me a lot about you," and we're just having a convo like about everything, art you know, home decor, just all the stuff that I'm just really into clothing, fashion and, and all this kind of jazz. And he's just like, yo, you really know, he's like, you really know hip hop. And like, he's like, I'm a skater kid. I come from alternative music and heavy metal and all this kind of jazz. And he's like, Hey man, I could really use a fresh young mind like yours. It's like really embedded into today's music because I work for Kanye and you seem to know all of the artists and what they do and, yada 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 like if i i might create a position for you if you're down for it for you to be on my team kind of laughed at it and sure enough about like yeah about this just a few months later it calls me i got a call i didn't even know he had my well obviously he got his number from his girl and he's like hey man what's up it's joe perez and the rest is history what i what i really love about that and what i want to ask you about is I think sometimes, especially when you're younger, if you're like really enthusiastic about something and you're really into something like people get on you for, it, especially if it's something that's like really esoteric and like really, really is niche. But I think now it's like you can take that niche thing. And before we started recording, I was telling you about a guy who runs like a podcast that's only about Jurassic Park yeah. and that guy, dude's making money off of it. So do you think it's important that if you're really into something to to me not be unapologetic about it, but be want to be enthusiastic about it because you don't know if that next person that you talk to, that your enthusiasm comes through and all of a sudden it creates an opportunity for you. Yeah. I mean, my, my story is, is a perfect example of that. Like I, I wasn't looking for no job. I wasn't looking, I was, I, I wasn't even 21 yet. You know what I mean? Like I was 20 years old when I met Joe and I, I was 21 when I, when I got the job to work for Kanye and I'm the perfect example of that. So yeah, you should. And I think that, I think that you should, you know, and these kids, these kids today are, are the brainchilds of that, right? Like they are a thousand percent more of anything that me and my generation was when we were first starting out that now that we're all comfortable and, you know, the, the standard and these kids are taking it further. They are, they're so much more of their culture than I could have ever dreamed of, you know? So I think that it's, 100% the way that you need to be but you need to be a junkie like you need to be a junkie of whatever it is that you love if like, you're a mechanic if you're a true mechanic then you know how to break down you know how to break down a, a four-cylinder motor 
you know what I mean? Like, like the back of your hands. Like if you're a true, true mechanic and that's because you're a junkie, you love this shit. You love getting down and dirty. If you're a stylist, you know, you know everything about textiles. You have to, you know what I mean? Like, how could you judge your, how could you give yourself a title of something and then not be able to know it right. fully? That's right. like ridiculous to me. So yeah, I wholeheartedly subscribe to that. Like you have to be all of it. You gotta, you gotta know every single part. You can't just be, I just love this. Like, yo, you better tell me who did shit in 1964. Like where the fuck did this shit start from? So can't nobody tell me nothing about hip hop specifically about its origins and like try to have me out here looking like a dummy. That's just how it is. Need to eat, sleep and breathe it. Yeah. So it was interesting how you mentioned the, the the Kanye university blog and how things change after that. And I want to harp on that a little bit because something that I think is important is it seemed like Kanye wanted to move away just from a blog as a way to document things and more as like a magazine and an editorial. And from what I understand, it looks like you and Joe Perez had a hand in that. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the first instances, at least that I can remember, um, before really social media coming into the way that it is now and the way companies work of like, Hey, we're going to put out content as an artist, as a company, as a brand, but we're going to do it in a way that's very storytelling driven, storytelling driven. If I'm saying that correctly. Um, was that really the plan from the get go? And how did you implement that? Cause I think that's really interesting of like, yeah, we're going to post content, but we're going to post in the way that tells a story that's more of like an editorial. That's more of like a magazine storytelling, which is now becoming more and more of a standard if it's, if not already, but back then it wasn't. So what was that experience like of, and um, I got some other, another question after that, but I want to ask that one first is that idea of like content as storytelling and as editorial. Yeah. That's really cool. And that's, these are one of those questions that I feel like people tend to often like overlook my life with Kanye. Um, you know, yeah. people just always want the Kanye name on their blog. No, that, that, <laughs> that, was, infra podcast. that was infra like you changed infrastructure, right? <laughs> you know, right. which is huge. Yeah. And the blog era, the blog era is probably one of the most potent eras in music history, right? It's like, it was the first time you could, you could discover really good, unique artists, you know, like you could find a Theophilus London who does very unique New York music. That's very hardcore New York. Like, like art, you know, Theophilus London, Theophilus London is my favorite artist that came from blog era because he's so, he, we wouldn't have a Tame Impala if we didn't have Theophilus London. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have Kid Cudi if we didn't have the blog era. We wouldn't have Drake if we didn't have the blog era. We all these things you're saying, I all I'm thinking of is one of my favorite shows that is not, not around any longer. How to make it in America? Yeah, and like his music and everything. <laughs> yeah, bringing me back. You know, you know, and, and to me, Kid Cudi, Drake, Wale, Big Sean, Mac Miller, and all that class from from that time are the biggest influencers in this generation, you know, and we wouldn't have them without that window. So I say that to say is that the blog era is something that people often miss that I was a part of and that I was helping push shift through the lens and the voice of, of Kanye. So you helped um, build the blueprint for it. Did you realize that you were changing things or was it more like, Hey, we're going to do it this way. And then like, after the fact, I was like, Oh shit. Like we, we changed things. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I understood it. I don't think I, I, I don't think Joe did. I think that the Kanye team probably absolutely did, but we were just doing a job, you know, and that job was just that. It was just doing a job. It was a job that was literally 24 hours, but it was a job. Um, I don't, for me specific, I can only talk about me. Like I didn't know that I was a part of something until 10 years later or five years because then I was like, I'm in the industry, I'm working it, I'm touring, I'm with this person and that person. I'm like, oh, hey, we did that on the blog. Like, oh, that came from the blog. Now, what I can say is that Kanye's voice is the reason why it shifted, but I'm very happy to say that I was a part of the think tank and the process and the distribution of it and being able to say, hey, yeah, this works, this doesn't work alongside that team um 
And it's not a coincidence as to why Don C is who he is today and not a coincidence as to why Virgil is who he is today. I mean, you know, Virgil was Kanye's ver- creative director for so long, you know, um, which leads us to say, yeah, you know, what we were aiming for is exactly what Complex, Vice, and The Fader is today. I think that the most potent version of what Kanye was going to do and doing, I think, in my opinion, The Fader is what, like, capitalized on it because it was missing. The vacuum, once once Kanye got off and The Vacuum was missing, I think The Fader is really what... Complex did it for a little bit, but The Fader has done it the best um in content creation and editorials what we were searching for was telling the the artist's music the the artist's story um and just making our own editorials from the brain or from the image of kanye is what we were going for so i think that to answer your question yeah the infrastructure we built but fader fucking crushed it for sure speaking of the artist's story because I think that's a really good... You would have thought we planned this, folks. and we'll, we, we didn't. I sort of did in the sense of my questions. Uh, so speaking of telling the artist's story, I know you had some involvement as far as using your own filter and your own taste level um, into how, like, what content and the editorial style. And that leads me to my question. Like, you're almost playing like not just tastemaker, but almost like an A&R role from music sense, right? Mm-hmm. And so how does that play into, uh, it, it seems like yeah, the, they were very influential, um, Bad, Bad Rabbits. Whoa. Is that, uh, is that, is that right? Yeah, I don't, I can't say I have anything to do with anything that the, that the rabbits did um, other than just being, other than just being a big groupie for them. I wasn't uh, by any means... I didn't have anything to do with that. Well, what I'm anything. saying is you bought you you bought Bad Rabbits into the like into the blog itself, right? Or getting I that tried. into the blog. Okay. I tried. Okay, 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 gotcha. Yeah. Um so when we were transitioning into the magazine that we were looking to create, I was in charge of finding the talent and then writing about them. And in two thousand and eight, I went to a concert at what was then Lupo's now the Strand to just go see Wale as a fan. I just wanted to go see Wale. I was a really fan. I am a big fan of Wale. And this band opened up for them. They were the only band that opened, that opened up for him, I think, and maybe one other person, but, and they were just the most incredible band on earth at that point. I just never heard music like that be presented that way. So on and so forth, man. I just never, I never heard anything like that. And I was able to meet the lead singer that day. His name's Dua. And I pitched it to them. He said, hey, man, this is what I'm doing. I would like to like have you guys be my first write-up. Unfortunately, by then, um, I had departed from... No. Nah, Kanye had departed from the editorial. How's it going? From the blog. Um, and... Yeah, it never got done. But my friendship with them ended up becoming something real. And that that's really how that goes. So, so speaking of friendship, I saw a post um, that you had made talking about Joe Perez, saying that you weren't, you know, hey, you know, Joe Perez was not just your boss, he was a mentor and, and a friend, and a friend to you, a good friend to you. And the reason why I want to ask that question is because just like you saw something in bad, you know, in, in bad, bad rabbits. Right. And as we were talking about before of somebody giving you an opportunity, my question is how important is it? You know, you had found a friend and a mentor in, in Joe Perez, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. And how important is it to, to find that mentor and what can somebody do if they, if they don't see that mentors immediately around them? And on the flip side, did you see yourself kind of almost ha- like doing maybe not mentor, maybe not mentoring, but like you see bad rabbits. It's like, Oh, someone took a chance on me. Somebody's mentoring me and helped me out. Like I, I have the desire because I really love this thing to help these people out. Yeah. You know, it, I'm pretty sure I got this from, from Kanye, but it's a, it's a Kari lyric, Kari from Providence. Sorry, Kari, um, swim team Kari. If anybody knows who he is, 
Kari has a song called The Giving Tree. And the basis of that giving tree is, is the song is that like, well, he has like a really cool poetry thing right at the end of the song. And it's really, it's always resonated with me. And he says like, I just need you to like, I'm a giving tree. So just take from me, take from me whatever, whatever you can. I don't care what it is, but just make sure you take from me. And that really resonates for me because that's the way that people, sh that's the way I, I like to be. I don't think that all, all people should be that way, but I think that's the way I like to be. Which is basically me saying that like, like we spoke about earlier, it's like you should be able to provide things for people. And the industry on, in its, in its purest form is people exchanging something with you. Somebody has something you want. I don't care how like, big you are but there's always going to be somebody that needs something from you. That's just how it is. How that, how that ex is exchanged is the most important piece. But at one point you're going to need something from somebody. You're going to want something from somebody and yeah, you have to be able to have that exchange. And my relationship with Joe started off as, you know, a mentor, a, a boss that turned into a mentor that turned into a friend and really how that exchange, how that grew is because he was able, I was able to grow and I was able to grow with him and I was able to grow outside of him. And then I was able to come back and be able to provide stuff for him that he needed to. And that was amazing. That's like, that is the best position that I could ever, ever be in in my life is that I grew out of something and I was able to come back and the table, the table was able to, I was able to bring something to the table and that's how really my, my friendship is with Joe. And we're still the best of friends of, as of today, I was just talking to him today and, you know, we've done a lot of great things together. I've, I've been able to help him and he's been able to help me and it's been a great exchange, you know? So at that point, it's not like I'm taking anything from him. It's just a, it's a really good, it's just, we're just partners. You know what I'm saying? I'm grateful that I made, I met him at such an early age and you know, it doesn't, it no longer feels, he, I, I've, as big as Joe Perez is, it's awesome to feel like I can stand next to him with my chest out. You know what I mean? Like, that's cool. Like I'm, I am the Joe Perez of my own space in my own world. And that's really great. Like I couldn't, I couldn't have asked for anything more. Speaking of growth and progressing into things, the next step on the, on the journey, it seems like just coming from a chronological perspective I'm not, I'm not going to pull a Tarantino movie. We're going to tell things out of order because that'd be too confusing. Um, Karma loop. Yeah. The, 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 the beast that, that was, is, was depending on was, how you look at it. Definitely Car was. Karma loop, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to my knowledge, you started as a model, but then you did other things. I think there was like a uh, post that had a business card, a uh, Karma loop business card. And it said model TV host, assistant studio manager, and men's stylist. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, was that the plan from the get go when you got hired by Karma Loop, or were you were you going in there strictly as a model, and then you were able to do other things? Yeah, no, I started off as a model. That was always the, I was always it. Um, I never had, I never could have imagined anything more for myself. I knew that I wanted to be a model, and that was it. Karma Loop gave me the opportunity to become something more of myself. Um, and I really, that is like the real start of all of my career. Like I owe everything to that place. And, you know, I was a inner city kid with no educational background in college or anything like that. And I was able to be, I was, people were, people in these high level positions were, had the patience to teach me something, you know, I learned everything I know about marketing because of that company from college educated people who were the forefathers of concrete junk, you know, concrete culture and, and everything that we know on the internet today, you know, literally everything that we know on the internet today, hype beasting, um, box hauling, you know, eating really close to the mic because people want you to, you know, I forgot what it, like it's called mukbang or something like that. Oh yeah. Yep. Mukbang. Mukbang. All of that. A everything that the internet is, internet is today, Vine, what was and what TikTok is today. I mean, Carmelo 
was the fucking grandfather of it all. So I was able to learn everything. And then also on top of that, become somebody because of it. So people saw me on, on the website. I became the Karma Loop Kid, um, which is honestly at that time was a very high honor. You know, being in New York and people stopping me in the, in the train station or any cool party that I was at. If I was at Santos Hearts Party or the Nokia Theater, just, you know, being my regular self, trying to watch a, watch a concert. Anywhere I was in Boston, anywhere I was in my own city, Specific, again, specifically in New York, anywhere I was, man, people recognized me for, for being that kid on, on that website. And then it then Instagram came into play and it was even more potent, you know? So I gained a lot. I learned how to be a TV personality. I learned how to be a tour host. I learned how to be a lot of things that I just could have never imagined myself being. So, I, you know, I remember in my early days when I, when I first started touring, I kept saying to myself, it's like, I'm just a model. Like, I'm not supposed to do this. Like, I wasn't supposed, if I definitely wasn't supposed to work for Kanye, I 100% was not supposed to be on tour. But somehow, some way, man, somebody saw something to me that was beneficial to them. And that was the exchange, you know? Those, those other things that you did within Karma Loop, right? You branched out from the modeling to those other things. Was that something that you just saw opportunities pop up and you, you like, Hey, like, Hey, that looks interesting. I want to do that. I want to learn more about that. Or was that, or was, or was it the reverse? Was it people in those positions, in those departments, seeing you and seeing you around and going like, Oh, you might be good at this. How did, how did that come about? Cause I think that's, that's something that's good to touch on, especially Thanks. people working in companies. Yeah. Um, my story is, is that, yeah, people just kept wanting to give me jobs Okay, because they thought that I was going to be okay at it. Okay. Based off the fact that, Probably without me, well, not probably, but definitely without me knowing, I was already doing it, you know? I'm a junkie when it comes to this stuff. I'm a junkie when it comes to, to textiles and understanding fashion and being unique. Um, so you start, you were enthusiastic about something. They're like, well, he's already doing it. We might as well. Yeah. There you go. I'm doing it. And a, a good chunk of the time I was doing it for myself, you know? Like I was gotcha. doing it to myself, like the way that I dressed, the way that I... um you know, just the way that I was living my life at the time, you know, it was just natural for me to be able to be this really unique kid. Anytime I stepped in the room, it was either my, my chains or my bracelets or my funky hat or this jacket or the way that I wore my pants. I mean, I was just really, leave, I was just really being just a young kid who wanted to be self-express, you know, self-express. I didn't, I never want to be limited by the things that I was wearing. So, you know, it was, it, it was like, it was like therapy, you know what I mean? Like, uh, that's the best way that I can express it. Is that, like, it was, it was important for me to just be myself. It was so important to me more than anything. In any room that I wanted to step in, I just needed, I need to be me. And, and me who I am in that moment. So, great, man. That spoke to people. What I, it leads me to a question that I definitely want to ask because I think especially right now, like right in, in the year 2020 in this moment, depending on when somebody listens to this podcast, um, that there's this idea or this perception that big company, big corporation equals bad, like automatically, which I don't think is necessarily fair. I think a small company can be bad and a big company can be bad, right? Uh, what was... you? Gain, it seemed like you gained a lot, but what was the... Uh, what was, do you think, some of the learning points as far as you had this big giant corporation that, but it gave you a lot of opportunities. Like what were just some of the like, like things that you were to pull from working for such a large company, a lot, large entity? Professionalism, man, 100%. You know, one of the things that I, I was able to learn from a lot of my, my professional counterparts in these like really cool high level positions was that the biggest thing that college teaches you because just because I didn't go, doesn't mean that I couldn't learn it, but what college at least prepares you for is how to deal with the things that you want to do in your life. And I thought that was the most profound thing that somebody could ever say to me. Um, my friend Casby was the one that said that to me, you know, and it was, it was always very profound. And at that time, and at that point I was, you know, I was already like knee deep in a, in a professional standing, but like, yeah, it's like you, you learn how to deal with 
the problems that come with the field that you, that you want to be in. So the fact that I was doing that stuff without having a degree behind it, um, is, is extraordinary. You know what I mean? To toot my own horn. I learned, I had to learn and I'm a sponge, you know, I like to learn. So I w- I'm really good at like shutting up in front of people that you know what the fuck they're talking about. You know what I'm saying? What are you exchanging and how are you exchanging it? Gibran touched upon a concept that in my opinion is both simple and profound. The first half is knowing what you are exchanging. Like Gibran said, there will be people who will need something from you, whether it's your talent, your skills, the work you create, your opinion, your cosign, your time. Someone, somewhere, will want something from you. The second half is how are you exchanging that time, skill, talent, or creative work? Is the exchange mutually beneficial for both parties? Is the exchange balanced? Is the exchange one of one or one of many? Like Gibran said, there will be a time where you will need something from someone, and someone will need something from you. The key is to know what you're exchanging and how that exchange goes down because those exchanges can lead to relationships, and those relationships can lead to great opportunities for you and those around you. I wanna go into what I think, um, you know, doing my research for this episode, I think it was a pretty pivotal uh, part of like at least your professional life post um, Karma Loop, and that was the Verge Campus tour. Yeah, man. That was, it seemed like it'd be a big party life. A lot of um, major things happened. One, the first question I want to ask about that was that the start of your like work when it comes to marketing and promotions and things of that nature or was it just like a continuation of what you were already doing that's a great question man that's definitely it was absolutely a continuation at that point i had already been working for karma loop for four years and um so karma loop and everyone that was in that marketing team are the people that i have to thank for teaching me about marketing. So once I got to once I got to the Verge tour, it, the Verge tour was something that allowed me to put into play my Instagram status, I guess in that sense. You know, it wasn't necessarily my marketing, but it, it was it, it allowed it taught me how I can monetize myself in in a greater way. And it also allowed me to do it. So I really thank the team that uh, there at Verge Campus that, that, you know, did that for me. So at that point, because of Karma Loop, I had garnered, um, you know, a tremendous amount of followers from just people seeing me on the Instagram, seeing me on the website, uh, modeling and and so on and so forth. So my fan base, you know, I I got my fan base from there and there's still people that follow that, you know, know me and I still keep in contact with from there. They were just fans from, from the day that I've never even met that just, Hey, like, yo, I just love it. I love your growth and you, you know, you inspire me kind of thing. And Verge Campus was the way that I understood that cool. I'm 24, 23 on a tour, on a major tour. And I'm, I'm the one that's on the stage. I can utilize my Instagram platform and make money off of it <clears throat> because I'm on tour with these artists and, you know, I, I was, I was viable. I had, I had clothing brands. I had jewelry brands that wanted to mess with me and, and did and sent me, you know, free gear and yada, yada, yada. And I did my part, you know, and it was definitely a part of the growth of the influencer industry. So the Verge Campus Tour allowed me to flourish in that and learn how to monetize my Instagram into dollars, you know? So it was fucking 
It was golden. I'm glad you went in that direction because I have some other questions really associated with um, with some of those statements. One thing I noticed during that time that you were on the Verge Campus tour was um, you work with Reebok. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, Karma Loop, we were talking about before, you know, is a big organization, big company. Um, Reebok, also a big corporation. Uh, you know, one thing I noticed, like, when you work with Reebok, my question is, how much control did like Reebok have over like what you were able to post or do? Like, how much control did they want to have, or was it more like? Um, so I think maybe it would be helpful if you shed some light on this. Were they more like, "Hey, go nuts! Like, just make sure the brand is featured or the product we want to push is featured." But other than that, go insane, do your thing. Where we want you. So, so like, was like, was there a lot of give and take, or did they let you have complete freedom? What was that like? That's yo know, yet again. That's a really cool question because. Um, these things can happen in certain in certain ways and in a lot of different ways, and it just it always depends on what your what you want to contribute or what the brand is asking of you to contribute. Right. So it, the conversation is always going to be different. Needless to say, what I I personally specifically did with Reebok that was sponsoring the Verge Campus tour. So um, at one point. <clears throat> It was just a tour, and then they sponsored me afterwards for a year. So for the 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 length of the tour, which was a month and a half with Logic, Cruella, and I, um, I had they had no limitations. They just said, "Hey, here's a bunch of product that's yours. Um, here's your sizes. Here's some clothes. Here's some shoes. All we ask is that when you post." You tag us. It wasn't anything. I didn't have to say, hey, check out these Reeboks. I didn't have to do anything. They didn't like give that. you like predetermined copy or anything like no. that? No. Okay. The only copy that I had was like once a day. I had to I had to post every day three, day, three times out of the day. And very simple stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's like I worked with my on-tour photographer. He knew what my deliverables were. And that's all it really was. It was just about delivering those things so it, it could be anything with like me standing next to logic and being like yo hashtag Reebok it was really that that simple I never had to like say yo go shop or do anything like that it was just like yo they want they like the way that I dressed already you know just like yo just do you like put flavor onto these retro re- these retro Reeboks that we have mm-hmm. and you know just do your thing you don't have to do it next to logic you don't have to do it next to any anybody famous it's just we are already cool. You have over a, th- a couple thousand followers already. Like you're going to help us just go, go with it. And that, that was it. From like your experience after that, is that typical of a lot of brands or is that like, was that unique in the sense that they give you, they gave you that much um, freedom? That's again, a really great question. It was unique at the time because the only people that ever got sponsorships, were athletes, rappers, and so on and so forth. So me being a part of this influencer culture that was growing and no one really knew how to to monetize it, manage it, speak to it kind of thing. You know, I was a part of that early group of influencers that in my own right was, you know, humble and fair. Like you had guys like from Vine that was remarkable. I mean, one of my, like one of my favorite influencers of the day who's now just famous in his own right never met him i'm just saying he's one of my favorites is is king batch you know if you know anything about king batch he's the coolest best funniest coolest actor on social media right now you know and he he when he was on he got his start on vine and uh king batch was the highest earning influencer on vine where he was getting i think the contract that he got was like a thousand dollars a revine something like just nuts like that you know what i mean so it was it's i just need to say that it's always depending on what your contract is and what you're contractually obligated between and what you you know fight for and i think it's notable um and you had you know just mentioned that i think it's notable that the time frame of that too is important to note because yeah. now, right in the year 2021, the idea of like influencer marketing, it's like, no, it's the norm. Right, but I feel right. like 
then, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like back then, it was a relatively new concept. 100%. You know, of like, are we going to get these inf- influencer marketing? Like, it was still... The term influencer wasn't even there either. Yeah, like, it was It was still being figured out. I mean, yeah. like, it's still being figured out now, but like, super early stages, if I'm not mistaken. No, it, absolutely, man. You hit it right on the money. For, for me, I was just a part of that, like, you know, new pool. You know, like, I was, I was a part of the culture that saw... Like halls, you know, H A U L's, U L S halls, which you mentioned that earlier too with the Karma Loop. Yeah, I mean, Karma Loop, Karma Loop created that culture of like, yo, let's go unbox this shit and like put it together, put it in an outfit, and you know, people making complete cultural shifts with just that. And it wasn't surrounded about Nikes; it was surrounded about Ten Deep, um, you know, and and all these all these awesome like streetwear brands that people fucking fell in love with. So I was a part of the, I was just a part of that wave. I was a part of that growth. There's people out there that had hundreds of thousands of followers, you know, beyond me, but you know, I, I was a part of it. And people knew me and people still know me for that, for that time, but it was definitely new. And it, the power was in the, you know, set at, at set time was in the influencers hands because these guys were getting hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of views on their posts you know, guys like King Batch. They're getting eyeballs and attention. Yeah, I mean, they, they were the biggest thing since TV, you know, and they still are the biggest thing since TV. And, like, how, how can you, how can you, like, quantify hundreds of thousands of people viewing your shit? You know I mean? When, right. When just, the, let's say, like, what, what's the, like, the highest viewed thing, which would be, my first guess would be the news, right? Let's just say the news is the highest watched thing in America, which is probably not, but I'm just, I'm just... I was going to say Super Bowl, but news would probably, you'd probably be right. Well, you're 100% right. The Super Bowl is the highest watched thing. The Super Bowl still would fail in comparison to what King Batch can do in a six second video. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, no, it, if, it makes sense. Like you're paying all that money for that one event, but like what's the ROI versus an influencer who's doing that not just one time a year, but like multiple mo- times in a like, month. Yeah. In a month, like on a regular basis. Right. And that, and that, that, then you, then you gauge it and you're looking at his numbers and they don't start to, dip, they don't start to dip until six months later, a right. year later, you know? So it's like King, I mean, King batch was to me, the guy that really set the fucking tone of how and why to get paid. And then when Kevin Hart came to the world, and he started to tell these 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 brands and these movie places that like no my social media is separate you have to pay a separate tab for that for, if you want me to talk about the movie then you need to set, pay me right pay me separately for that I mean that changed the game as well so there's a lot of people that were like crucial and important to how I'm glad you brought that because I didn't even think about that but that's such a good point I mean it's crucial like for me as as an Instagram kid and now Instagram adult like those moments were pinnacle because then I was able to do the same. You know, I need residuals. I need, how long are you going to use this? Like, how long do do you plan on me pushing this? Yada, 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 which pushes the price up like uh, just tremendously. One thing um, that you mentioned as far as like, you know, it's the influencer Instagram creative side. So I want to ask like the flip side of that question in the sense of, um, when should a, not just even a big brand, but like when should a fellow creative who like, yeah, they're, they're good at the thing that they do. Um, and I think a lot of times people want to try and do everything themselves and it probably gets to a point where they can't do everything themselves. So because you're on the one side of the, the, the equation, I would like to get your opinion as when do you think a brand or a business or another creative, uh, when can, and when should they hand off like the marketing approach to somebody like yourself? I mean, in my opinion, I think a, a perfect, one of my professional colleagues would say that once it's already established, but I'm always a, a like a fence guy because you know you, as a market as a marketer I can help people at the ground level as well. Yeah, I think that 
the point is, is that most people don't want to waste their time if it's at the ground level because there's nothing to gain there. Some, some, <clears throat> some people in the marketing game can see it, you know, and, and that's the difference. I, th I think that to, to take your question and flip it on his head is that my only, my true opinion to give anybody that's like looking to have this question answered is that like, just do the work. Um, even if you're just about to start, like the best thing that you can do is create, you know, create the spreadsheets, create the, create the plan, you know? And if you think that you have a really good idea that you haven't started yet, but you can project then you can bring that to somebody that's in marketing or PR or whatever. And, you know, people can see the value in it, but you have to set the value in things. So you got to know what you're doing, like know your business too. But I, to answer the question that, you know, that's my opinion on it, but to answer the question, like you should already be a working viable business a year, a year after you started before you, try to come to somebody that can market it for you because the product has to be, it's like shark tank. You know what I mean? Like some of those guys on shark tank were in business for a month and did phenomenal. Some of those guys were business in, were in business for 15 years. And it was just like, bro, this is fucking shitty. I can't believe you don't have nothing. Like you have no paperwork to back up the things that you're saying. Like we can't, we can't actualize this. We can't even... It's going to be well thought out regardless of how much time... Like, it has to be well thought out. Yeah, that's all. I think that that's the biggest difference. And if we take into consideration what Shark Tank is, I mean, that's that's what... You're looking at those guys to help you push your brand further. So a market, um, a person that does marketing can do that for you. And like, now those guys are in finance and they're looking to invest their money into things. But, you know, I've seen... I've seen all those people on Shark Tank take something that was a, a week in business but that had all the paperwork like, yo, this is where I think my growth is going to be. This is how much I've sold in a week. This is how much I'm selling in a day. This is what my numbers are. Like all I need is the, the infrastructure. Now the information and everything was put together and presented in a way that was like, okay, you can see everything from a high level very easily. And it made sense. I mean, gotcha. that, that's another thing is like, you have to have a business mind. So like you better make sure that it fucking makes sense because a business person is going to, is going to chew you apart. So as a, so as a person that's marketing. So that's, that's my opinion. That's, that's my take on it. I think that's good advice. I think that's good advice for any business, any creative trying to you know start their own thing. Um, one thing I noticed from uh, the Verge marketing tour was, correct me if I'm wrong, that was the start of you hosting. And if I'm not mistaken, the whole hosting thing, that was kind of like thrust upon you. Yeah, pause. <laughs> but <-dooms. laughs> No thrusting on me, guys. <laughs> <But -dooms. laughs> that was the best and worst choice of words ever. Uh <laughs> I try, folks. I try to keep. Nah, I try to keep the comedy going. Nah, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah, man, it definitely was forced upon me, man. It was like, um, so in Carmeloop at that point, I was already there for like four years, and this guy named Max uh, was there in the marketing team, was putting this this tour together. He got some really good investments. Uh, again, he had never done a he had never done a tour before. So this is a perfect segue. Because this tells the true story of that, like, you don't have to ever have done something in that, in that field before to be able to be trusted, right? So Max has had worked with Little John, but he's never, he's never done a tour before. He's never built a business on a tour, but he had a marketing plan. He had a business plan and, you know, he went to the right people, finally got a catch and was able to get a $2 million tour and he was only like 26 years old. You know what I mean? So I'm a 24 year old kid. The guy that put the tour together is a 26 year old kid. His friend, his partner is a 26 year old kid. And we're on tour with Chance the Rapper, Kendrick Lamar and so on and so forth. So, um, to come back to how I got into, got into hosting, I had already started, my own TV platform on Karma Loop TV, where I just was interviewing artists. I interviewed Funk Flex. I interviewed... I saw some of those. Yeah. I interviewed Funk Flex. I interviewed... Um, fuck. 
God rest his soul, uh, the guy that passed for Mob Deep, damn, the hip hop guys are going to kill me for this. Prodigy? Yes, Prodigy. I interviewed Prodigy, I interviewed Scoop DeVille, and I interviewed a couple other guys, uh, artists. So that like, it was already going for me. But then I, I, I did... I did a lot of other stuff during throughout Crime Loop. So long story short, the guy was like, yo, man, um, I really, I really like you. Like, I see how cool you are throughout the company. Like, you know, you got a lot of great personality. You got a, look, a lot of great character. And I feel like my tour is really missing something. And I think that you're that final piece. And he goes, yo, like, have you ever, have you ever hosted before? And I was like, absolutely not. I've never hosted anything before in my life. He's like, I think that this is like the perfect position for you. Like we're leaving on tour in a couple months. So I want you to sit and think about it. And then, you know, once I'm ready at the turn of the year, then, you know, I'm going to come revisit this conversation with you leading up to the tour. Cause this is definitely going to happen. And I was just like, yeah, right. Whatever. Completely like dodged it. Didn't, didn't believe him at all. And sure enough, he came back to me right before the spring started and he goes, hey, so you have have you thought anything about of what I told you, you know, a couple of months ago? And I was like, bro, like, I really haven't. But also, like, you don't want me to host your tour, bro. Like, you have a multi million dollar tour. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot on stake. Like, I've never done anything like that in my life. So, like, I think that you should just go get somebody that's professional at that. And you know, like, I don't want to ruin your tour. Get somebody who's got the experience who's done it before specifically. I don't want to make you look like an idiot. That's a lot of money, Max did not take no for an answer. He literally took that conversation that I said, which is, that was the last thing that I said to him. It was really simple. I told, like, it wasn't that much of a big conversation. I just said, Hey man, I'm not the person for you. I appreciate it, but go find somebody that, you know, can do this for you. And he goes, well, at this point, I don't really think that you have a choice. Um, I really, I know that this is something that you'll be able to do. I will work with you. I'll help you through this. Um, I'm going to take care of you. And I think that this is going to be a really great opportunity for you for, to come on the road with me. And I know that you're going to exceed at this. So he's like, I already talked to Greg, which was the, the owner of the company. He goes, you already have the days off of work. Um, you'll be gone for a month and a half. This is how much I'm going to pay you for the month that you're gone. You'll have a stipend, yada, yada, yada. Just goes through it. And he goes, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. We leave, uh, bus leaves in two weeks. And I was like, Max, like, like okay, yeah, Holy I, shit. no, no, I didn't even say oh, no, okay. really? oh, no, I kept damn, telling okay. him no. He goes, he, he, I'll never forget this. He didn't listen to me. He just gets up and he goes, I'll see you in a week. You know, I was like, I'll see you in a week and a half. And sure enough, dude, this dude pushed me. I didn't accept it until the day, the night before I packed a bag. Holy shit. I packed a fucking bag. I met him in Boston we flew, we flew out, we flew out to Florida. My first stop was Orlando, was Orlando, uh, Orlando. Yeah. And Florida, Florida. And I never looked back, never fucking looked back. So that leads me to the question. Do you think that sometimes, you know, cause you were, you were telling them no up until that final point. And I think this perfectly leads to this question. Do you think sometimes we as humans and as creatives, we can get in our own way or we don't, you know, for whatever reason, we don't think we're qualified for something. And then, you know, we just need to say, screw it and just dive in and see what happens or like, or sometimes the universe or other people will give us that push we need. Yeah. I think that, I think that all of that is correct. In my specific situation with this was that I actually think I was being forthcoming and, and pretty much honest. Like I should have not been on that tour. I was just a model. You know what I mean? I was just a kid who modeled. I've been, and like I've touched stages and I've been touring since I was 21, but I was like a stage hand. I toured with my guys, the oxymorons, a stage hand. I was tour manager. You know what I mean? So I, I wasn't new to touring, but I was never the front man. I never saw myself being the front man. So I think I was telling the honest truth that I wasn't the right guy for it because of my that said point in my life. But like, you know, 
it's like Disney. Sometimes think magical things happen and the universe had different plans. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, shit. I'm really glad I said yes, because I made a lot of mistakes that first couple of weeks. I made a lot of mistakes. I was like, I'm making a fucking fool of myself. But I, if there's anything that maybe Max knew or didn't know, is that like I have I have humility and I'm not really ashamed to make mistakes. So maybe that was the catalyst, you know, for me. Maybe that was the bridge that helped me make it to the other side where I took the challenge and fucking championed it. You know, I became a great host. I became an amazing entertainer. And like, that's probably the first time I've ever said that out loud. I'm, I like what I do and I appreciate that people like what I do. So I knew that at one point, once I started to say to myself, like, damn, I like what I do. I think I'm good. And then the compliments started to come through that the cut that were bridging. It was like confirming what I was feeling. And I was like, okay, well, if I like what I do, then yeah, people will be able to like what I do. So people will feed off that energy. Like if you're into it, then they're going to be into it. Yeah. And it was difficult because was, I've never been in front of hundreds of thousands of people. You know what I mean? We were doing, <clears throat> we were doing five shows in a row. You know, I was really on a tour. I was really on a tour. I was falling asleep at 3 a.m. Once the buses rolled off and waking up in the next city at 7 a.m., and doing it all over again. I was really, I am and was really touring. I was really fucking touring. I think this is a perfect segue into this question. Was the Verge tour the start of or continuation? Because I think a lot of people like have this goal now, now that like influence marketing stuff has been a thing. Like, I feel like you have all these different talents and everything, but you are getting paid to be you, yeah. which is an awesome thing, right? Absolutely. Would you say like, un, like unapologetically, like I do not allow anybody to shake or tell me how to be. And that's, well, no one can, because no one can be well, you, but you, well, I mean, a lot of people conform, you know, and like a dollar, a dollar can shake somebody's morals real quick. I see what you're saying. Okay. And I don't allow that. Like you can't, you can't conform. You can't try to dictate my creativity. If you, if you're booking me for something, DJing, hosting, modeling, then you're booking me because my talent is specific and you're not going to sit here and try to dictate to me what you think is best for what's, for what I'm creating. Was the Verge tour like a genesis of that or was that already happening? The And again, like the Verge tour was like an evolution of it definitely an evolution of it. It's just the next step. I mean, at that point I had already been working for Kanye West since I was 21 touring with the oxymorons. They, Oh, my brother's the oxymoron since I was 20. You know, I was already, I was already coming to those terms. You know, I was, I was already on Karma Loop. I was already doing things. I was modeling and being on billboards and it was just a young, scared kid from Providence, Rhode Island that that didn't um, didn't think that he deserved much of the things that he was doing, you know. So, but I was I was achieving it, and I was achieving it because I was fearful. So, by the time that I got to Carm, that by the time that I got the Verge Campus tour, it was like a milestone and it was like the realization that like man I don't have to be a rapper to be talented I don't have to be a football player to be talented I don't have to be the things that are happening in my head because I don't I don't like I'm not a DJ I'm not a rapper and like these things are tangible right like you can grab these things and I just was very naive to my gift and what I was doing regard with my eyes closed, you know, at that point, like Verge Campus opened my eyes and up, up until that point. And then I started to see clearly gotcha, what okay. I could achieve for sure. So I think so, little tidbits of those statements you just made. Amazing. And also, um, I think segue into some questions I have. One being... Um, it's a multi-part question, 
But just to give to give it some context for both you and whoever whoever's listening, there's this um, saying uh, called "flatten your heart," huh. and what that saying means, um, <sighs> for from what I understand of it, is that you don't get addicted to the highs and the lows. You kind of you keep steady, and I've noticed that about you, and and I think that's a great trait to have. So going with that, um, thank you. You know, you're welcome. Uh, You've worked with a lot of famous artists, Kanye West being one of them, but you've worked with a lot of famous artists. And what I've noticed is that, you know, working with those famous artists, and again, I'm going to have more questions, a couple more questions on this. But one thing is that, do you get starstruck? And if so, how do you like keep things under control? Well, like you don't get starstruck and you don't fanboy out. Or do you? And we, you know, people just don't see it. I am a true advocate to many that's like against the grain that you should be a fan of the people that influenced you. And I think it's really fucking whack and corny not to be a fan. And a fan means that you get excited when you see an artist of any caliber that you appreciate, influenced you, inspired you, and... I'm very much that that guy. Like, I don't have any shame being able to say that I fangirled out. Like, I don't got no shame in that. Like, I'm not overbearing. I'm not fucking, like, crying and fainting and nothing like that. But am I... It, it was my heart part, like, pop, like, whatever it's called. Is my heart fluttered. Palpitating? Yeah, palpitating is my heart you know, in my throat and is my palm sweaty when I see these people and am I stumbling over my words when I talk to people? 100%. Am I eager to be like, yo, you, oh my God, you don't know what you did for me in the summer of 2014 when this song came out or when you did this painting, like you don't have no idea how the girl that I connected with at the time, like it, it, you was like the groundwork for our relationship or things like that. Like, I mean, that, that to me is a true fan and that's the right way to be a fan. You know, I think that the people that were of Michael Jackson era was definitely like a little bit obnoxious, but you know, I, I take by the words of Ray Kwan of, he said, if he said that when, you know, your idols are in the room, you know, you tend to listen, you tend to quiet and tense up. I have those moments too, but if I have the opportunity to speak to somebody that changed my, my life, you know, just by the things that they put out into the world. If I have an opportunity, I'm going to take it to say it, to, to, to show appreciation, you know, and, and I'm very much, very much like that. And the only people that I've ever really, I've had those moments with is very few far in between because not many people growing up, I was like overly influenced on. And the very first person, which everybody really knows is Lupe, you know, but my, my career coincided with Lupe. I was able to see Lupe anytime I asked for across this country, across this world. So those that relationship was really cool and it grew and it came to the point where the person that was that was his best, that is currently and, and was then his best friend, his DJ, his producer, you know, took me under his wing. It's like Kanye says that when people take a, take a liking to him, they gave him nicknames, you know, so the person that took a liking to me and allowed me to be around him was his, you know, right hand man and called me his cousin. You know, he called me his little cousin. Uh, yo, that's, that's my little cousin any single time. So I never had a, a relationship with Lupe specifically, but I have a relationship with all his tour manager that I still talk to today, his bandmates, all that jazz. But Lupe, anytime he sees me, it's just like, Oh, yo, Simon's little cousin. Like, what's good, brother? Like, Th those are the things that I like I haven't with Lupe is the only one that I haven't been able to like expand on and like talk to and stuff like that. But I had a fangirl moment when I met Nas. I had a fangirl moment when I met Lauren Hill, DMX, with God rest his soul. Uh, most deaf, Talib. I've met. I met Jay. I met Kanye. I met Beyonce, Rihanna, Tiana Taylor, Neo, Raekwon, Fab. Uh, shit man I've met all of my favorites I've met all of my favorites and I'm you know I, you can you, you have to be able to know that like these people are just people too so it, th these people can appreciate you saying I appreciate you you know it's but yeah. everything in everything case by case and in moderation so I am 
you know, that was a long winded, but not, no, no, that, not that, that, all, was, that was perfect. It was what that was. <laughs> not at all like afraid to be appreciative of people's artwork that influenced me without a doubt. Well, speaking of appreciation, one thing I appreciate about you, and it t- kind of flipped the, not the same question, but kind of flipped things oh, um, on its head. Uh, at the same time, right, you've met all these people, all these, you know, heroes of yours too. Heroes yeah. to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And, and thankfully enough, I've worked with a lot of and, them and as well in them. different capacities. Yeah. So you've done that. But at the same time, you yourself, you know, there's, there's been times where you've, your picture, your, you know, photo of you has graced, you know, Times Square. Yeah. Which absolutely. not many human beings on this planet can even say that, which no, is insane, right? Yeah, let alone uh, once, let alone a couple of times. Yeah, let, alone, sure. let alone multiple. You yeah. took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say, not just once, multiple. Um, in, in this day and age where, you know, everybody is trying to get their 15 minutes, or at this point, 15 seconds of fame, um, when it comes to social media, I, I'm, I'm misquoting Andy Warhol, but it, it went from 15 minutes to 15 seconds. Well, because social media. Yeah. Uh, what I've appreciated about you is that you, like, there's a humbleness and there's a, it's, it's like you put stuff out there. It's like, Hey, here's like this cool thing I did, or here's this person I really look up to, or here's this thing I'm working on, but it's never a, it's never been a look at me or like, look how great I am. And there are people who do that and I'm turned off by it. Some people dig it. I don't, what would you attribute to that? That like, you know, you don't, you're, you're humble and like you're, it's like a, a gratitude and humbleness that I've, I've noticed just from even like the stuff that you put out and the way that you post things, which not everyone does that. And if anybody was going to like, if anybody would have a reason to brag, it would be you and you're not bragging, which mm-hmm. I think is great. And I just want to know what, what do you think attributes to that? I'll break that down in three points. Um, I'll, I'll start with the fact that telling people that I did something doesn't do anything for me. Right. Like I already did it. So there's nothing that I achieve in gaining in telling people, haha, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Like I'm not here for, uh, the applause, you know what I'm saying? Like I like the work. I like the groundwork. Like my favorite thing is six months to a year than seeing something that I worked really hard to achieve, whether it be it for someone else, for myself or with people, that is the goal of my life. Like I, I set a goal, then I set, then I set a plan to achieve that goal. And that is the glory, right? Like that is the fucking glory that the steps that were pre-planned to achieve it, achieved it. So that's, that's rule number one is that I'm here to shift culture and I have, and I still continue to. I was going to say mission accomplished if that's what you were setting out to do. Right. And I still am either through myself or through other people. So impact is my, is the only thing that I care about. Like I'm not here for the, the, the momentary like applause because applause is cool, but like, Am I changing people's minds? Am I changing the world? And that doesn't need to be noticed because it's not for me. It's for the greater good. So I don't need no applause to do good things. Secondly, I attribute that to my mother. Growing up, especially within my career, I was living with my mother throughout all of it. And as a kid, we never got Christmas gifts. As a kid, we never got like big birthday parties. I grew up poor. I grew up very poor um, to a single mother who did absolutely everything that she ever could to give me a fucking great life, which she, she definitely did. And without her being able to, you know, speak it, the point was, is that family is all that ever mattered to me. So Christmas felt just as good as the kid that got a thousand presents to me because Christmas, I spent it with my family, you know, and that was fun to me. I was able to perform in front of my family. I was able to dance with my family. I was able to dance with my mother and laugh, make jokes and have memories. So 
for whatever balance, chemical balance in my head, my mother instilled that the things that matter the most is not the things that we have that's tangible, but it's the things that we can't grasp that are undeniable, which is, again, the love that I have for my grandmother, the love that I have for my aunts, my uncles, my brothers. That that played a role. You know, I'd come... I My modeling career started professionally at the age of 21, but I was already doing stuff from 16 to 20. My first real big gig, I came back home with a magazine and my mom was just like, cool, this is great. Go clean your room. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, this is cool. She but, humbled you pretty quick. But it wasn't, it wasn't because she didn't appreciate the shit. It's just, it was just a sense of like, this is not as important as you think it is. Like, cool, you're on a magazine. Like, go, like, go, come put, where's the money? Like, come put some fucking money in my pocket so that we can pay the bills. You know what I mean? Gotcha. And that happened through tours. That happened through working for Kanye. Even if my my mother vaguely knew who he was, like, all of that was like, okay, you've been gone for a month. Like, we got to get some shit done. You know what I'm saying? Like, the house needs attention. I need attention. Like, let's go get some shit done. So it, it was frustrating a little bit in the beginning of like, I'm fucking doing all this great shit, but it's like, all right, but home needs you. And that was the biggest lesson that I that I learned. And lastly, my friendships throughout that time with that I with that idea that I that I gained from my mother was that I understood that the pe- the only people that I cared to impress were the people that loved me and that I loved. So, which was a very small circle then and now. And those people know exactly who they were. They were the people that was around me all the time. There was the people that I invited to come see me. They gave they got access to everything that I did. Just they were. In every single right, these people that I'm referring to who know who they are were me, period, you know? So I didn't have anybody else to impress except my friends, and that's all I ever cared about. You know, I want to, I wanted to be good to my friends, and I achieved that. And, like, people that appreciated me outside of that, great. But, you know, I had a very linear path, and I stood on it. And I always quote, in my head, um, but, uh, Mr. T. Mr. T has this really famous interview where he like clocks a, a, a woman that, that was interviewing him making fun of his shoes because he was the most paid man in the world and he's this and he's rich and he has all these gold chains, but he had these really fucked up shoes on. Needless, needless to know, she's making fun of him and he goes, well, you know, he humbles, he humbles her and he goes, these shoes remind me that I know where I came from and that no matter, no amount of money can ever change my mindset. And I know that I have responsibilities to people from my neighborhood and the entrepreneurial kids and I'm a black man in America. And like these shoes remind me that no sort of materials can ever change the path that I need to be on to, in order to help my community around me. And it's a very impactful interview to see a man who's at the top of his, the world you know, as as big as a billboard, as big as anything, humbled somebody that was trying to make fun of him because he had something as stupid as like shoes that talk. You know what I mean? So they had uh, duct tape on, you know? So you take that mindset and, and you understand what's really valuable in life. Bite your lip and take the trip. It was interesting to hear Gibran talk about hosting the Verge campus tour. Looking back, Gibran was a perfect fit. But when the idea was presented to him, he wasn't jumping at the opportunity. Because the tour and its stakes were extremely high. And because Gibran never hosted a live tour before. Luckily, Max, the creator of the tour, didn't take no for an answer. Creating a sink or swim situation. And Gibran swam adding a new tool to his already expanding creative toolbox. Life will give you sink or swim situations, and life will give you people like Max that will push you well outside your comfort zone. While these situations can be scary, they can lead to life-changing outcomes. So to quote Curtis Mayfield, bite your lip and take the trip. 
It could be life leading you down a path that was meant just for you. So I want to ask, because I've seen that you've got, you know, you've been out to Boston, New York, L.A., and so many other places, right? And it's, you know, I would assume that if you wanted to go base yourself out of L.A. or Boston or New York or any other city of your choosing, you probably could and you'd probably be successful. And you have those choices, right? Yet you remain here in Providence. What, what would you attribute to that? Because I can't do anything for people from where I come from outside of the state. Simple. Gotcha. Like, that's my answer. I like, I can't, I can't help anybody if I'm not here. If I'm not somebody that people can say, hey, go talk to him or whatever that means. I mean, just take it for whatever it is this quote means to you. I can't help nobody if I'm not here. So that's it. Now, would you say, so now uh, another question, would you say that that desire to help, because I've, um, I'm going to relate this to, uh, hopefully it's still on Netflix. If not, my apologies, everybody. Uh, there is a documentary about uh, Clarence Avant, uh, quote unquote, um, not quote unquote, AKA the Black Godfather. And if you watch the documentary, it's actually really cool. Um, Pharrell like did the theme song for it. Oh, shit, I'll, I'll definitely send me the link to that. And like to um, if I can find it, if it's on Netflix, I'll I'll send it to you. And um, but basically, what you find out watching the documentary is that Clarence Avant was he was not a, like specifically a musician or an entertainer, but he was called the Black Godfather because when you start watching the documentary, he's behind all these like record deals and entertainment deals and all sorts of crazy shit. And like everybody in the industry knows him, but like the general public like didn't. And then like the song that Pharrell did for the documentary was really cool in the sense that if we don't appreciate him now, like we got to appreciate him now before he's gone. And it's and it, what's what's crazy about it is that in the documentary, they keep like um, as like a transitional like mechanism, they show that he's like the center of this like crazy universe. And then there's all these like constellations of famous people that are connected to him. And he's like the center of it, which is kind of, kind of a cool storytelling mechanism, yeah. but also just shows you how important he was. Right. I would say that you remind me like, and the reason why I wrote this down in this question is that you have like a, almost like a Providence version of the Clarence Avant in the sense of like, you have all these connections to people like Chachi, Loki, stay silent, John Hope. Um, you know, yeah. what would you attribute to all all those all those connections um, as far as like the way that you're just like interconnected to so many different things? Cool question, man. I think that the proof is in the pudding is that we all collectively between all of my peers that you mentioned and all the ones that, you know, aren't mentioned is that we all have the same mission is that we achieved for ourselves and our achievements are groundwork for other people to achieve in their own right. So I think that that answers the question. It's like Kari, my boy Kari, sorry Kari on Instagram, um, has a song that he and I spoke about this weekend, this past weekend while I was in LA with him, that I told him that really changed my life. It was really like a pinnacle moment for me because it's a song called The Giving Tree and he's talking about being, you know, people taking from him and that he enjoys that in, in his own right. And I, I just took that ideology and understood that that's what I enjoy. And one of the quotes towards the end of the song, right before it fades out, is like, just take from me, just take from me, no matter what you, uh, man, I can't even remember it. Just take, just take, just take something, you know, like no matter what how long we know each other, or how, how long we last, good or bad, like just take something from me. And it's very powerful to me. So that's where I want to be, man. I want to be somebody that like my peers, one, I'm influenced by my peers as well. Like I am a fan of my peers and 
the art that they create, whether it, whether it be a gift of gab or, you know, professional, uh, the best in the game in, in marketing and in, in event curating and event directing and f- video and all this jazz is that like, you're supposed to take something from them. And if you're envious, then it's the wrong attitude to have. And I'm not here to be, I'm not here to win the, the, the Super Bowl. I'm here to win for you. So that's my answer to that. It's like, I just, I just think that people should be able to learn from me and take from me in business, art, push, stamina. <laughs> like, just come on. You know what I'm saying? Like, if there's anything that you're going to see from me, if there's, if there's just an, an iota, it's a small thing that you like about me, take it, take it, build on it, watch it grow. Cause I promise you that where I'm at right now, I'm so sure of myself. I'm sure of the things that I do. And if you like the things that I do, then I can promise you that you can achieve the same within your own right. And that's, that's how that should be answered is that like, it's never, it's no longer about what I can do for myself. It's about what I can do for other people. So like, that's, that's the goal, man. It's, that's been the goal since I was a kid. So one thing I've noticed about you <laughs> is that like, uh, like a Clarence Avant, um, even though he was not an entertainer or a musician, he was, I would consider him a polymath, just like I would consider for who did the theme song, a polymath. I would consider you a polymath in the sense of, can you explain that to me? I don't know what that is. Um, it is a person, there's a couple different definitions, but the way that I define to people, like the short version is that very skilled and very knowledgeable in like multiple disciplines or multiple areas. Cool. And I would say that you like, you know, hosting, modeling, DJing, you know, marketing, promotion, so many different things. Um, were you always like that? Or was that like an evolution? Like, were you always just into different stuff and learning different stuff? Or was that more of an evolutionary thing? And the second part of that question is, do you think now with the landscape of creatives and just how the world is that do you have to be that way? Like you, you, you almost like, cause I, I've, I've seen some things where it's like, it's almost like getting like, you can't just have one income stream or one thing you're good at anymore. Like you have to be good at multiple things anyway, but you seem to be naturally just that way. Like, nah, I think the only thing that's natural about me is that like the desire to be a good person, even though I feel like that sometimes as well. But What's natural about me is that what doesn't what what doesn't kill me is only going to make me stronger. So I'm always going to learn from my mistakes. And what's natural about me is that like I am okay at looking at the man in the mirror, good or bad. I grew my skills were learned. My talents are definitely natural. Now, my skills as far as to being able to project, if it's in a business aspect with low key, as, is to understand what is on brand, being able to know my team and what their talents are, what they're good at, what they're not good at, and being able to, being able to encourage them to be better, encourage us to be better. My talent is being on stage, being able to perform, be an entertainer. But even that grew to be a skill because what's natural for me, you what's natural to a person, you have to be able to dedicate and practice towards. So I would say that all of this was things that I had to grow and practice on for sure. Whether it was, whether it was like natural for me, which I think my, my charisma is natural, but my entertainment is not. I had to learn how to be an entertainer, even though I it was like, I am likable and I'm easy to talk to and stuff like that. But all, everything of how my mind works had to grow to that. I had to grow to learn to be accepting. Um, even if I just had like a little bit of it in high school or middle school, like I had to learn, I had to unlearn things that I knew eventually was gross thought, like disgusting thought. Um, 
I had to learn and be better continuously of how to be a good person. So for instance, like now the world um, has this new path of pronouns and, you know, these new things, these new things that I want to be um, accepting of. And it's, I have to learn how to be that. I've always been accepting of new thoughts, but I have to learn how to, before I speak to anybody and ask like, Hey, what are your pronouns? I want to be able to respect, you know, I have to like that. It has to be in practice. So that goes with anything else in the world. That's just a small, like concept, but it's like anything that I've done in this world, I have to grow on that. You, you got to learn it. You got to practice it for sure. So you've learned and practiced multiple things. You have multiple connections. How do you choose like who you work with and what projects you take on? Like what goes into that? Morals, man. Morals. Like, okay. uh, you know, some things can just be business and other things can be passion projects that have to fall in line. But standards, man. I got standards. I got, I have a high quality work ethic and standards fucking standards man like I, I don't i don't i'm not the person that needs to do anything gotcha at all so if you want to work with me it better be good it better be well thought out and you better you yourself better be a good person your team should be too so standards man morals like I, i'm not in it for money I like yeah morals background how do you stay current in the sense of just like with what is going on right now, but at the same time, simultaneously, you're not becoming trapped or encapsulated or attached to a trend or a notion or a thing of a certain time period. Because I think as we were talking about before with the whole karma loop thing, like karma loop like came and then it had its time. And there were, you know, brands, people, personalities that were like attached to that. And yeah. then when that went, they went. And yeah. you can could, you could say that for X amount of different things, right, right culturally. Right. Um, yet, you did not suffer that, that yeah. same thing. Stay fate. relevant. Uh, so, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you do that but, but without, like, attaching yourself so much to the current that, like, you're still you? Yeah, I think, I think a best, the best example of that is, like, Snoop Dogg, right? Like, Snoop Dogg is still one of the most relevant artists in hip hop, pop music and all that. And I think that it comes with, a, like we said before, coming into this question is like being accepting of change. I think that's one of my natural things. It's like, I'm, I'm, I like new things. I like new shiny things. I like unboxing things. I like new things. Even if I know that the technology or this thing has been done before. Like I like to see things that are re-imaged, reimagined, repurposed. I love that. And I also love things that are old. I love texture. I love quality. I love, I love those things. And that comes with my, my, my artistic background of, of like, you know, understanding that some things get recycled and you can look at something that's the same differently for sure. Different point of view. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like art, you know, music, everything is subjective. So if I'm continuously pouring myself into the things that I think that the way that they should be, then I'm going to limit myself. I know that there are like the Marvel universe that are factual. You cannot undo this. This is not, this is undoable. Like this, this is, this is like, you cannot change this. Yeah. This is like rock solid. It's, it's, it is, it's canon. You right. are not messing with this it. This is definite. This is a definite, but if you can learn to understand that there aren't many things in this world that are, you know what I mean? You'll, you'll live, you'll, it'll be an easier life, especially within the creative world. But there are also people that are hard stop. And that's like a canon. That's like people who are hip hop purists have their, have their right in the world. Do I agree to that? No, nah, but they have their right in the world. You can be hard stop. New music sucks. This is whack. Yada, yada, yada. Cool, man. Then go live in that world that serves you. Go be surrounded by the people that do. And I think that that's what it is, is that you should, like, you can either be a part of the wave and appreciate it see it for what it is 
you don't have to conform. You can be pretty much, you know, a flower in the wind, or you can be, you can be a stump. You could be a tree and be solid, firm right here. Either way is okay. Either way works. It's a room for everybody. Like, <laughs> I'm just not that guy that thinks that, he, that my, my way is the highway. I like changing. I like growing. I like new things. I like new technology. I like new mindsets. That's why I mentioned pronouns and all that stuff. I like anything that's like really accepting. That's my, that's my gig, man. I like people that can look at cool things, even if they're not what's normal right now. And because I, I was that kid. I dressed funky. I dressed this and people thought this of me and people thought that of me because of the way I dressed and maybe the way I acted. And then when I was in perfect, you know, when I was in public and that's cool. You could, you could think whatever you want of me, but I, like, as long as I know who I am, like I got no problem. I, like you can't shake me. You know what I'm saying? So that's like that. That's, that's that man. You can't shake me. I like, I like new cool things, man. I like new mindsets. I like reimagined things all the time for sure. Getting down to the final three. One I definitely want to ask is, um, to reference a previous episode, uh, Mikey Fengley was saying how he's, you know, he was talking about how like the city of Providence and what's going on in the city. Uh, and for anybody who's listening to this outside of Providence, like it's been province centric, intentional and unintentional. But anyway, he was saying how he's seen like what, what's happening in the city of Providence. There's a lot of creativity going on. A lot of things that are like, bubbling up and things are going to be happening and that, you know, he was saying how if you're not a part of it, you better become a part of it now before it like gets to a certain point <laughs> yeah. or you're going to miss out. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning him, shameless plug, but also, but also, uh, you know, what would you say is a tribute tech? Cause it does, it right now does feel different and like the last time i felt like this and this is probably showing my age is when like cnj records was a big Ooh, let's thing go. you know what i mean <laughs> let's like, go like this was like like when like cnj and unity and all these things were you know yeah, yeah. Were, fat, were, were, fat hill boys fat hill yep absolutely uh, ja, ja Pan recorded in my yep, bedroom one time exactly. so like yeah, there you go japan was the f- yeah. oh. In Providence was the original yeah. host. I mean, yeah, I mean, so the original club host was Japan. The bro. last time I seven I, summers straight, I I felt like this kind of way about the city that I live in was that. So, what would you say as somebody who ha- has all these connections and so plugged in? Like, what do you think is a trend? Like, why is now like a, a like a special time? Because now more people that dissed it before are now seeing that it's a fad and they want to be a part of it. Okay. So for you to for you to mention C and J lets me know that you've been a part of this since the jump. And for us to think that it's a new time, it's a new world. Providence is on the up and rise and like you better get on the fucking way. Fuck you, bro. Fuck you. Because this shit has been popping forever. The only difference is, is that you wasn't aware because you, you wanted to be somewhere else. That's it. So don't come to me continually, continuing to try to tell me that Providence has only been popping for the last seven summers, for the last 10 years. That's fucking bullshit. Chachi had this shit on smack way before any Fed Hill boys had this shit on smack way before John Hope had this shit on smack Word. like you know what I'm saying the names go on and on record it yo we just lost a great we lost one of the greatest DJs uh, I was gonna say we we yeah I, I was surprised when I heard that 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 announcement I was like wait what what happened like so so don't sit here and try to tell me that that Providence is new to the game and, and, and by the way just um I'll, I'll say the name CR the beast exactly you know, may, may he may he rest in peace and, and he will and also just uh I don't you know and I'm not gonna speak for somebody else I don't think Mikey was saying that this is a new I'm not thing. Saying, I'm okay, not saying okay. I just, I, I just that wanna, is the mindset. I just, I just don't want. I just don't no, want. No, it's all good. Create not, any, no, any. I don't know. I don't, like, know. Ah, I don't know. even know who Mikey um, is. But, uh, but as far, I, I think is, it's just like it, like, like it feels for and for me too. Like I felt it before, and then for a while it didn't. Like you know, things were happening, but it, it this level of um, excitement 
And the, the, the reason why I agree with Mike, like the level of excitement for me and, and I, as somebody who's been around for the CNJs, yeah. for the CR of the Beast, for the John Hopes, for the Jaw Pans, yeah. it feels different right now. Like there's a level of excitement that I haven't, like, like it, 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 something went dormant, at least for me, something went dormant where it wasn't as exciting. Like just, there wasn't things to go, like to go to. I just can't agree, man. I just can't agree to that because it's, it's a lack of information. And maybe that, and that could be it. Maybe, maybe it's that, a lack that's of it. information because it has, there was no low and maybe there was, maybe other people will say, yeah, there was a low. It, it just wasn't for me because does anybody know who Mr. Mr. is? Who Roger McKenna is? Like before that man left to LA, he had, he was one of the, one of the very few artists from Rhode Island to pack out the Met. It's just unheard of. Chachi packed out the Met. When you when you say the Met, just because, just the for Met my own Pawtucket. reference. Okay. Oh, I was going to ask if you were talking about the Met in Pawtucket or the Met that was in the back of like the original Lupos. No, nah, I mean the Met that was that's in Pawtucket that's been there for a while. It, you know, so it, you got you got guys like Chachi who was on TRL. Like you got guys like John Hope that toured with Nas. Like I, I just don't understand when people try to say that somehow this, this frenzy is new. Now, remember that marketing and advertising is the change in that. That is to me, the only difference is that people have more access to these things. So maybe that's what it is. That's it to me, but it's that. And also the fact that now that people have eyes on all the cool shit, Motherfuckers want to act like they know about it. Nah, bro. Jay Nasty has been DJing since fucking URI days, bro. Like, it, it, there's so much that you're missing here. There's so many, there's so many things that have, been, like, Cam Bells is on tour right now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, him and uh, Hennessy. But Hennessy not just Hennessy, but also I can't, and X amount of other people. Yeah, and, and the, the, the young kid, I'm sorry, that got the multi million dollar deal. I mean, like, you know, people don't understand how valuable my peers are to the industry in Rhode Island. So when people when people say that, yo, it's now Rhode Island, it's not the, nah, bro, you're just now getting perfect to it. You are just now getting perfect to it. So don't dis, like, it's just a slap in the face of my peers. Again, to mention these greats like Jay Nasty, Campbell's, Hill Holler, you name it. it, it like, I can continue. What you want to talk about? The 90s? You want to talk about the early 90s? Because I can talk about artists in the early 90s that had shit popping too, that toured with the hottest artists in that time. We got DJ Chubby Chubb, who's been 50 Cent's DJ since the start. It's been around forever. So how the fuck are you going to try to tell me that, that, that Providence isn't popping, bro? And he reps Providence, bro. I've heard 50 Cent speak about Chubby Chubb being from fucking Providence. You, you can't sit here and tell me that Providence just got popping, bro. No, you just got pervy to this dope ass fucking shit that you listening to. So don't diss my people. You know what I'm saying? My peers, niggas that I grew up with, motherfuckers that I watched across the water or whether we was on the same platform or not. You wasn't here, bro. Again, like I said, Japan was the first person that I saw host parties, concerts, and be a crazy rapper. Like You, you just don't. All those things. All of it. So when we speak about when we speak about people being the first to do something, no. The only the only difference in catalyst is social media. Is that now more eyes are are able to to grab onto things now, and that's great. I love that. But this new generation can't take all the credit because Chachi been on TRL. Chachi opened up, uh, was on TV. Who else you know was on TV as a rapper? Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, I'm not, I can't, I hate that. I hate that. I hate that, that term that people think that Providence just got popping. A rap music has been working with Dipset since high school. And it continues to. And continues to. And is the greatest producer coming out of Rhode Island. And correct me if I'm wrong, headlined um, Day Trill. I forgot what year. Uh, uh but I know he had like one of them, but I'm, 17 I'm or 18. blanking on the year right yeah, now. Yeah, 17 or 18. B okay, let's not talk about music. Boo Boo, a boxer, 31 and 0, just the other night. 
he's been knocking niggas out. Like, it's not just music. It's not just that. I mean, we got people, you know, shout out to the shorty that sold out Providence Place IMAX Theater. A couple, uh, like a year, either during the pandemic or before it. Like, yo, there's people out here that is doing shit, bro. You know, not to interrupt, but then I think this is a question I want to ask um, before the final two. Yeah. It just, it, it just popped into that, my head. That, I'm just sorry. That, that. That question no, no. angers me because people keep trying to tell me that like, yo, Providence just got popping. No, the fuck it so, didn't. So I don't think that, but you know Especially what? not talking to me, nigga. I've been popping. But you know what I think? You know what I think? It, it, it leads me to this question though. And something I've noticed because for me, as you said, you were like, as, as soon as you mentioned Japan and dot, 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 like, okay, yeah. I know you, you've been around for a while, right? God damn right. What, one thing I've, I've noticed and... Yo, DJ Knockout, bro. Come on. DJ Knockout, where's Nasty at Monet? Come on, man. So Cat's been Cat's been really doing my, shit since forever. My question is, is it a and I wonder maybe maybe this is it, maybe this is a, a an issue. Is it a documentation thing? And what do I mean by that is like there were so many things that I experienced going to you know, going to see Chachi, like, right? See other beasts, CNJ Records, Japan, Fet Hill, that I can't access now. Yeah. Which is, it's a shame. Yeah. Right. So I wonder, is it, is it a document? Is, is it an issue of documentation? Then go talk, things being, then, no. these things being well then, documented. Then go talk to Larry. Go talk to Larry, the comedian Larry. My, my guy is, is Providence's own historian, bro. I can't think of his full, his full um, artist name, Larry. If you, if you know who I'm talking about, you know who I'm talking about. Go talk to Larry then. Cause Larry can tell you everything. Yeah, I mean, Larry can tell you all of that joint. And it's not a lack of documentation. It's a lack of memory. Like Instagram, yeah, you could scroll down and see what people did in 2014, but Cass was doing stuff in 2009, 2010, well, 2006. Well, I'm saying documentation is like, I would love to like be able to go online and like hear like, like yeah, uh, certain mixtapes and stuff like that. And you can with certain things, yeah. but not everything. And it'd but be great you can get a gauge because all these guys, all these guys and women are speaking about each other. In these Good things point. that are saying. Good point. So don't tell me that you can't. If you're listening, you will find out. Comp Street, Camp Street and Comstock, bro. It's one of the best songs that ever came. One of one of the top 10, five, top five. It, it, yo, in some of these, in some of these directory, directory, it's number one best song that ever came out of Orlando. And John Hope is still smacking these records. You know what I'm saying? So you can't. Agreed. You, you can't. How do you quantify it? Like, how do you really sit here and try to tell me? Then go do your research, bro. Go listen to these songs, listen to these street records, listen to these street stories. Because Campbell's has been talking about Rhode Island since his first mixtape. Campbell's, his whole family is like Rhode Island royalty. You know what I'm saying? His grandfather, his father, like, helped the, the, the West Side be what it is today. You know, you can't you can't sit here and try to like these cats are still talking about their forefathers and their forefathers might might be bloodlines and they might not be. But like if you think that Rhode Island has only been popping for the last seven years, you stupid straight up. And if you can't if you yes, it's very true that a lot of it isn't documented, but a lot of it is. And you can hear it if you listen to what people are saying. You'll hear their beefs. You'll hear their influences. You'll hear the the stores, the bodegas, the gellas, the the this, the that, the when 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 um uh fuck what's on what's on their street, man. It don't matter, man. All the- I was gonna say not much anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and I, this is somebody who lives yeah. there. So you know, needless to say, man. Even though my train of thought was lost, it's like you you you're just not doing the right research. That's all I'm saying. You're not listening correctly if you think that. Providence has only been popping for the last seven to 10 years. The last two. First one, how would you look at your, uh, your progression, progression of your just journey, your career? And how would you look back on that? And what are you looking forward to? That's a cool question, man. I, I see it. I see it as, 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 uh, I see everything that I've done right now as a work in progress. And I've worked to progress to this and I'm still putting into practice the things that I've learned to get better at it for the next step. Um, DJing has allowed a brand new 
space for me that I never thought I, I could achieve. You know, uh, quarantine, given that I started DJing right before the pandemic, you know, I was about a year and a half in, still learning, still journeying in that. If you ever want to nerd out about a records or DJing, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> um, quarantine really, really scared me, but also calmed me down. So I attribute a lot to what I'm about to achieve in the la- in the next couple of years to quarantine because it allowed me to just settle down, accept, be happy, enjoy the fucking ride. So these next couple of years, man, what, what I am setting off to do next is really being a better businessman, taking DJing, allowing it to create this, this world, this universe that I've always wanted to create, man. And I'm really happy about that. Like LS, LLCs for something that is skill and talent based is amazing to me that I'm in this space. What I'm doing with, with my teammates at low key is tremendous. You know what I mean? We just had a great weekend right now. Like from Thursday to Sunday, it, it was a low key weekend. Like you had me at Cortland Club. You had Jen at Troop on Friday. You had Watts and and Charlie Toons at Troop on Saturday. Chino say solo on the hill. Like me at Revival Sunday. Me at Nara. Like I, we are cornering the the market. There's so much to achieve, and I feel grateful that I'm able to be able to be the mind behind it all. You know what I'm saying? And to be able to like push this, this kind of things through seeing us, you know, nearly four years later with a bustling business, a business mindset between all of us where we're all achieving individually and collectively me, myself as an individual. I mean, this summer was one of the best summers of my, of my life, like being flown out Washington, Atlanta, Miami, Connecticut, New York, Brooklyn, uh, California, all in a summer where, you know, I'm doing it because of DJing, because of music. So, you know, the future is bright for me, man. You know what I'm saying? And the shit just, just getting started. I still got stuff that after the, you know, just this weekend is now being planned for 2022, 2023. So I'm in such a great space. My relationship is great. Like shout out to my girl. Like, um, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm in the best space that I could ever be. Everything that w- we're achieving here at Revival, like, I, you know what I'm saying? There's just so many, my, my, I am Dr. Octavius, like my brother Emmanuel yeah. said, you know what I'm saying? I have so many tentacles to be able to achieve yeah, things. You're, you're pulling your, you're doing your Clarence, Clarence Avant type stuff. Yeah. I'm going to send you that documentary because I think you would dig it. Yeah, for sure. And it, it, you know, it's just the beginning, man. It's like, I, you know, I'm still connected to a lot of a lot of my good friends everywhere. And my good friends mean anybody that ever fucked with me, whether celebrity or not. Everybody is on the same wave as me. And I just want to do good shit. I want to do dope shit. And I want to be, yo, quote, unquote, and y'all see this in 2022, but I want to be good people. And that that's me telling y'all something. You know what I'm saying? That good people quote right there, that's me saying something. That's me trying to take myself somewhere. So if you know, you know. But 2022, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming big. You know what I'm saying? So good people, man, forever. Like that, that's who I want to be. Good people. And final question, advice to other creatives, old, young, et cetera, and advice to your younger self. Yo, no advice to my younger self because my younger self did everything that he was supposed to do. So that's that. I ain't got nothing to say to him, man. He made me proud. I made him proud. That's it. Everything that I got to say to anybody else outside of that, yo, please, man, just be you. Like, it's, it's, everybody says this, but for real, just be you, man. Please be a good, be a good person. Be good peoples. And don't be afraid to go out there and achieve something, man. Fall on your face. It's okay. Like, humble yourself. And go achieve it, man. Just do something, man. Please. Just do something. Go, go, whatever it is, even if it's just for you, go do it, man. Because it's better to have achieved and failed to not have ever achieved at all. So, like, just, just, or to never have failed at all. Like, just go do it, man. Please. That's, that's, that's what I got to say to everybody. Go fail. Go do good shit. Don't be dope. 
fuck with yourself, love yourself. Hell yeah. <laughs> with that, I think that's a perfect way to end it. Jabron, thank you so much. Hell yeah. Creative Capital Show. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Till next time. Hell yeah. Absolutely, man. We'll revisit this in 2022 for sure. Appreciate it. I I fuck with sitting down with you, and I I love seeing you in the scene and enjoying the moment, man. You've you've definitely making your mark. And that, you know, that that quote goes out to you. I try. Yeah, man. That quote quote goes out to you, too. You know what I'm saying? And I do see it, you know, and and people notice that that when you're there, you're there. You know what I mean? And people are going to ask questions like, who's this guy? And you're doing your thing, man. And I appreciate that you're, you are trying to do your due diligence and your job of like just documenting and speaking and being a part of, being a part of it and not just pointing at it. You know what I mean? Or, or trying to like, like gain something from it. You you are literally just a fan and I, you know, you're just as important as all of us. You know what I'm saying? So it, it takes, it takes people Thank like you, you to be able to push it. us towards, towards the next level for sure. I don't think we could have ended that any better. Hell yeah. Till next time, everybody. Cheers, motherfuckers. Creative Cap- Cheers, everybody. Creative Capital Show. Till next time. Got my drum and my kit and my phone. Peace. I love y'all. <laughs>